We could have cut his head off and this whole thing could have been over. But that is outside of God's design for my life. I could have, and and even though I'm angry, and even though I'm frustrated, and even though I want to end this whole thing and walk away, I will praise the Lord. Hands, feet, mind, body, soul, spirit, I will praise the Lord and sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. In other words, why would he stop being good to me now? He's setting me up for the biggest victory I've ever experienced in my life. He changes. He goes from lamenting to praising, and it's because he's experiencing the challenges of waiting on God while resting in the peace of knowing God. Amen. Praise the Lord. C-O-T-R. Praise the Lord. Let's stand to our feet this morning. Anybody got expectations of the word this morning? I have expectations. I come with high expectations. I know you can do amazing things, Lord. Let's stand to our feet in a time of prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to receive your word. Lord, nothing else matters. We just want to hear from you. We want to be challenged by this word, Lord God, in healthy ways, prodded by this word. Lord, we want to see ourselves in this word, Heavenly Father. We need this, God. So help me, Lord, Father God. Let it be that they hear your voice through me. May they be engaged, equipped, empowered, and encouraged to do your will on this earth. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. If you could remain standing for the reading of our scripture today, we're coming out of Psalms chapter 13, verse 1 through 6. And this is the psalmist David is speaking. It says, for the director of music, a psalm of David. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God, give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I've overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise. For he has been good to me. That's a good place. If you agree with the psalmist David, that's a good place to praise him. You may be seated in his presence. Amen. Today's message that the Lord has given us is entitled Vengeance. Vengeance. You may get your toes stepped on a bit today. You may be challenged in healthy ways today, but you will most certainly be engaged, equipped, empowered, and encouraged to do his will on this earth. So let us lock in and avoid any hindrances or distractions. Listen. Quick story, I know I always got a story, but uh, quick story, I was downstairs with my older brother when we were about, had to be about uh, maybe seven or eight years old, he was probably uh, 10 or 11, uh, and we were downstairs in our basement, and we had just gotten these race cars for Christmas, and so in our basement, there's just one single spiral stack that goes up, a step of stairs that goes up, and we were racing our cars around the stairs, and And I was winning. To this day, I believe that my car was in front. But his story is that he had lapped me. His car was going so fast that his car went around mine one whole time, and it seemed like I was in the front when really I still had a lap to finish that he had already finished. We still debate about this to this day. Y'all pray for for me. And so we went around five times, and then once he got around five times, he says he won. I'm saying, no, I won, and we're going back and forth, and we're yelling and screaming, and while I'm yelling and screaming, trying to convince him that I won, he's dancing in my face, I won, ah, I won, and so my heart started burning, and my eyes started welling up with tears, and I clenched my fists, and I looked at my brother, and he was, you couldn't convince me, he wasn't the enemy. And I went after him with everything I have. I pushed him from here, y'all. And I shoved him with everything 
I had. And, and his back was to me. So when I pushed him, he's falling like this, trying to get his balance. And, 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 and unbeknownst to me, there was a table that was in the basement that had glass in it. And so he's heading straight towards the table, and to get his balance, he, he, he falls into the table, psh, glass is everywhere, and he picks up his hands, and his hands are just drenched in blood. I go over and I look closer at my brother, and there is half of his thumb, about a quarter of his thumb actually, is hanging. The flesh is hanging. Mama, you remember that? The flesh is hanging from, she said, oh, I, oh, oh, I remember. The flesh was hanging from his, from his thumb, and he's screaming, screaming and crying. So I start crying. I'm bawling out crying. There's blood everywhere. The, the, the everything is, I'm just, I'm just crying, crying. And then after I, I finished crying, I realized, I realized, this is going to sound bad, but it's true. I wasn't necessarily crying because my brother was hurt. I knew my brother was going to be all right. He go, he go, they're going to stitch him up. He's going to be all right. When daddy gets home, and finds out I broke that table and bloodied up my brother the way I did, it's gonna be a situation. And so I started crying. I started crying. This was a not, not a good situation. To this day, you can, you can look at his thumb and see the piece that, that got, had got, it didn't get ripped off, but it was hanging off, and we, we still talk about that to this day. My story is I won. I don't care what he says. I won that, I won that race. What's my point? What is, what is getting in here? We're going get to get to this idea. It's a, it's a small and, and, and not so innocent case of, of, of revenge, but we're going to talk today about this idea of vengeance and how it manifests in our lives and in the lives of those around us, us as Christians. What do we do when we want revenge? What do we do when somebody's seeking to get revenge on us? Let's talk about it today. Listen, way back when Satan held position in, in heaven as Lucifer, he had made up in his mind that he was going to overthrow heaven. He was going to claim the throne of God for himself, so he went about causing division right there in heaven, gathered a third of the angels in heaven to join alongside him to cause war that, there, that he would be able to get the praise that God got, that he would be able to sit on the throne like God sits on the throne. Now we know that God is Elohim. He is all-powerful. He is supreme. There is nothing that goes past him or above him, and so being the God that we know, the Father that we know, God, Lucifer, that now Satan, the wanderer, kicked his behind and a third of those angels out of heaven. Then enter Adam and Eve, and we have Adam and Eve that are enjoying paradise in the presence of God, and enters in Satan. And Satan comes in, and we know the story. He tempts Eve, and, and Adam, with his eyes wide open, sinned as well. And now we have the fall of mankind that we're still dealing with today to this very day. But what actually happened was the reality is the enemy seeking vengeance. The devil was mad because God kicked his behind out of heaven, and he was considered a loser. You're out of here. You're done. You're finished. And how? what does a coward do when he wants to get revenge on somebody? that he can't beat. He picks on the children. He picks on the little guy, the little person. And so this is when he slithers into the garden and he causes the fall of, of mankind. It was out of an act of vengeance. I got kicked out of heaven, so now I'm going to mess with your kids. Act of, of, of vengeance. You see, it's for this reason that we can conclude that any time that we seek to get revenge by our own hands and our own time, that we are coinciding with the very acts of Satan. I'll let it sit. I'll let it simmer. We can conclude that any time we seek to get revenge, we're linking up with the very actions of Satan him, himself. You see, the, the reality is, the hard truth is, revenge is always, always motivated. It's always motivated by the flesh. Revenge is. Revenge is always motiva motivated by the flesh. It causes violence. It causes death. It causes deceitful acts. And, and it's the playground for the manifestation of all kinds of evil. That's what revenge, that's what revenge is. That's what it, what it does. You see, it, it, revenge attempts to usurp earthly and godly authority. I could have gone to my mother and said, you know, Mom, you know Mikey is he's taunting me, and I don't like it. But I didn't feel like doing that. 
My flesh wanted to push him. I didn't mean to push him into the table, but my flesh wanted to push him and get what? Revenge. It's motivated by, by flesh, and it attempts, it attempts to usurp earthly and godly authority, and it shows a lack of patience and seeks to control the situation over God. It usurps authority and seeks to control the situation over God, and it steps all over what patience what patience you had. You see, terrible things happen when you seek vengeance. You see, when we act on our desire to get revenge on our terms, terrible things are going to happen. Revenge on your terms. You can count on it. You can book it. When you seek revenge on your terms and you act out on that revenge on your terms by your hands, you can guarantee terrible things are going to take place. Don't y'all know we know how to mess stuff up? It's one thing we can do is mess something up terribly when we act according to our flesh. And revenge will always do that. Listen, the reality is in inner cities all over the United States, one of the leading causes of, of gang violence and youth violence, gun violence and homicide is retaliatory uh, uh, violence, gun shooting. They shot my brother, I'm going to shoot him. They shot at my friend, I'm going to shoot them. They, they, they did this, they said that, I'm going to get them. Every single time, so many detectives are finding that these are connected. It seems like they're isolated uh, cases, but sometimes it's five months down the line or, or a year down the line or two years down the line and they find out through investigation, you shot him because five years ago he shot so-and-so and now they're getting revenge. It just goes around and around, it's called the violent cycle. It just goes around and around, and then when that person get revenge, guess what? Guess what? The, the, the son of the father that you shot will grow up, and he's going to try to find you, and he's going to try to kill you. And it just goes around and around. It's revenge at your hands. Terrible things are going to happen. Rumors are spread, and privacy is violated when you seek revenge by your own hands. And we have to be, to be real with ourselves. These, this flesh is capable of doing some terrible, awful, and ungodly things. When we seek to get revenge by our hands, we'll take a secret that we ought not to tell somebody else, and we'll tell it. Deep down in our heart, we want to we wanna get revenge over, over something that they said or they did to us. Let your boss tell you something in private, and then your boss makes you mad and upset. You're unsafe. Some of the unsafe folk, some of the saved folk. Well, well, I, I can't believe that he's going to write me up for this, and I haven't been here for 10 years. You know, you know, let me tell you something that he told me not to tell anybody else, but I'm going to tell you right now because, and then you just spilled a man and spilled a woman's business. And you're doing it because you want, you want revenge. Rumors are spread. Sometimes it's not even something that actually happens. Come on, you remember before we were saved, some stuff that you would engage in, some of the rumors that you would allow your, your ears to hear and some of the things that you spread, and you might have told yourself, well, it might be true, so let me tell it. And then you spread, spread that rumor. Maybe it's because of somebody was, was messing with you or somebody was bullying you or somebody did something to you. Rumors are spread and privacy is violated. We see this all the time. It also happens in politics and our earthly leaders and authority. We see it, all, we see it in debates, all kind of stuff happens. Rumors and privacy, things that are, 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 are smeared all over the place. It's, it's vengeance. It's revenge. Betrayal takes place when we seek revenge by our own hands. There are people who sought revenge by betraying a loved one, and maybe it's through infidelity or, or theft or unsuspected crude acts. I saw this one show. I don't remember what the name of the show was, but they were showing what goes on in restaurants and hidden cameras when the waiters uh, 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 approach a rude customer. My daddy told me, if you don't like the food, don't say it until after you're finished. <laughs> don't you say, don't say nothing slick, don't say nothing until you've eaten your food in it, because sometimes, sometimes, and I saw this show, they will do some crude, rude, and disgusting things to your food if they, if they, if they think that you're being rude to them. What is it? It's revenge. It's vengeance. Terrible, awful, crude things can happen when we seek revenge by our own hands. These typical acts of revenge are always motivated by Satan and the flesh. Now, I'm not standing up here trying to, to convince you that it's easy to avoid seeking revenge. 
There are some folks in this sanctuary right now that have dealt with the loss of a loved one, maybe at another one's hands. There are some folks in this room right now that have been, that have been molested. Maybe you've been molested. Maybe you've been, you've been raped. Maybe all kind of, of terrible things ha have taken place. And I'm not standing up here in front of you telling you, oh, it's easy to, to just forget revenge and it'll be all right. No, because we got to deal with this flesh every single day. And so I'm not standing up here telling you that it's, it's easy to do it, but instead I'm trying to encourage you, in spite of it being difficult, understand terrible things will happen when you seek revenge on your terms. It can be extremely difficult seeing somebody who's done wrong to you seemingly go without immediate punishment. And that's what we want a lot of times. The minute it happens to me, I want something to happen to them. Why? Why should they get to go for four years, five years, six, seven, eight years, nine, ten years, and nothing happens to them? While I'm dealing with the pain that I'm having to deal with every single day, I'm going to therapy, I'm worshiping my God, I'm reading my word, and, and this happened to me, and this person seems to just get off scot-free. I'm going to do something about this, and your flesh starts to rise up. It's difficult. We got to be, be real today. It's hard. When things happen to us, our flesh rises up, and we seek immediate justice when the way we see it. You see, the truth is our insatiable desire to get revenge by our own doing it exposes the reality of how we really and truly feel about God and his ability to handle the situation. And I want to say that again because that's where I kind of want to land a little bit today. Our desire to seek revenge on our terms, how we want it, when we want it, it speaks to how we truly feel about God's ability or our trust in God's ability to handle the situation the way he needs to handle it. If you're struggling with vengeance, with getting vengeance, with seeking revenge, and, it, and at one point in your life it was just consuming you, I'm just, I'm just here to prod you. Maybe, just maybe, that speaks to how you really, not just what you say, not what you say, and not how you look when you come to church on Sunday or Wednesday night, but how you truly feel about God's ability to handle the situation on your behalf. If you feel like you've got to step in and do something, maybe, just maybe, it's because you feel like God is asleep on the job. And this, this becomes the reality for, for far, too, far too many. Seeking revenge for ourselves stems from a lack of trust in God's ability to handle the situation. Maybe, maybe you say to yourself, well, God is just too slow. He's too slow. You know how long ago that this happened to me and this, nothing has happened to this person yet? God is too slow, so I'm, I'm going to take, take matters into my own hands because he's not or she's not going to get off scot-free on this. God, God, you might just act too slow. You haven't even given God a chance yet, but God, you might act too slow on this. So, so I got this opportunity right now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it. I'm going to take it. Or maybe, maybe you feel like God is soft. God is a softy. If I don't do something to him or her, God might just let them off the hook. God, God, God just, he just might show them grace. And if he shows them grace, I'm not going to get what I want. I want blood. I want them to suffer. So, so instead, of, instead of leaving it to God who might show them grace, how hypocritical is that? Instead of, instead of leaving them to God who might show them grace, I'm, I'm going, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not like God. I'm not going to show you grace. You're going to feel the pain that I felt. And so, and so we move forward with whatever, whatever acts we wish. Maybe, maybe you seek revenge because you feel like God doesn't know. He's either too slow, too soft, or he doesn't even know. He doesn't even know what happened to you. In your mind, he doesn't, he might not even, I'm sitting here tossing and turning about this stuff, waiting for God to move, and he probably doesn't even know what happened to me. <laughs> he probably doesn't even know. And, 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 and if he does know, then guess what? Maybe just maybe he doesn't care. Because how could things go on like this? And I still feel like this, and they still seem to be able to go on with their lives. This isn't fair. God, either you're too slow or you don't know. Either way, I'm taking this thing into my own hands. I'm going to, I'm going to, you start trying to use scripture. I'm going to do justice. <laughs> the desire for revenge comes from hurt. 
comes from uncontrolled anger. And the, and the conscious or maybe subconscious decision to forfeit your peace to get revenge. You have to understand this. As a saved and sanctified man and woman of God, peace is an option. Joy is an option. Goodness, patience, kindness, love, self-control, all of these things are options. And so when you allow this uncontrolled hurt to, go, uh, to, 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 to rise up in you and you start focusing more and more on the, on the idea that you think God is too slow, he doesn't know, he's too soft, he doesn't care, you are subconsciously or consciously saying, okay, peace, we're not going to choose you today. We're going to choose all this other stuff that we were rolling around in, and we're going to do what we got to do. And terrible things happen. And terrible things happen and you get mad at God. Lord have mercy. The truth is our plans for vengeance is a weed that chokes the fruit of the spirit within you. Those plans for vengeance. And, and I mean secret stuff. I'm not trying to read y'all mail, but stuff you know that you did that and nobody else gonna find out about. How could they possibly pin this back to me? <laughs> How? How? But the reality is those plans for vengeance it's seed that you've sown and is going to yield weeds that seek to choke the fruit of the spirit that wants to grow on the inside of you. You are forfeiting your peace, your joy, your goodness, and your kindness when you seek that, that revenge. The spirit of revenge will rob you of all of your fruit if you let it. What does God say about, about vengeance? Romans chapter 12, verse 19. He talks about this over and over. Whenever God repeats a theme over and over and over again, two things are happening. He wants you to understand the importance of it. He wants you to understand how much he cares about it. And then he also wants us to understand how much he knows we're going to struggle with it. That's, that's, I, I'm giving y'all some gems right now. Whenever you're reading the word on your own and you see a theme starting to repeat, it's because God, it's important to God, and it's also probably something that he knows you're going to struggle with. So he says it again and again. Y'all got that? Watch this. Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. If he said it, I believe it. All right, now. Let's go to Proverbs Chapter 24, verse 29. And you can never repay the way God repays. Let's talk about this. Proverbs chapter 24, 29. Do not say, I will do to him just as he has done to me. I will render to the man according to his work. Don't do that. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 22. He goes on and on. I can do this all day. Do not say, I, I'll pay you back for this wrong. Instead, wait for the Lord. And he will avenge you. Either you believe it or you don't. Wait for the Lord and he will avenge you. I can give you about 72 more scriptures that talk just about don't get revenge. Don't get revenge. Don't get revenge. I know you're mad. Don't get revenge. I know what they did. Don't get revenge. I know what she said. Don't get revenge. Don't do it. Don't do it. I know when you wake up in the morning, that's what you want to do. Don't get revenge. Don't get revenge. Over and over and over again because he knows we struggle with this. Silently. We struggle with this. God emphasizes this, emphasizes this, because it's crucial. Watch this. David is an amazing example. I love it because you can look at David, and not that that they're all the the other uh, folks in the Bible and biblical figures are not they're not real and 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 just transparent. But I mean, David is transparent on a whole other level. In the Psalms, he's lamenting, and then he's praising, and then he expresses frustration with God. Then he expresses praise to God. He tells you everything that is on his mind and on his heart. It's all right there in the scripture. And so we go with him on this journey to his emotions and his ups and his downs, and it's all so poetic and beautiful. And, and in the midst of, of the Psalms and in the midst of, of what we can read, uh, David is, is a perfect example of somebody who is struggling with the, 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 the pitfalls of vengeance, of getting revenge for himself on Saul, right? And then at the same time, leaning in on, on trusting God to get revenge for him. 
he try, he goes back and forth. So I should do it myself. I should, it's taking too long. God, is taking too long. But God, I trust you. Oh, there he is. I should cut his head off right now. God, I trust you. I trust you. Oh my goodness, my enemies are going to celebrate when I die. This isn't fear. How long can they go triumphing over me? But God, I know you're going to get him. I know you're going to get him. I know you're going to get him, Lord. It's all right. It's all right. Down, David, down, down, down. And he goes back and forth. And it's poetic as, as he does it. Listen, you understand this. David is running for his life. In our opening scripture, we read it. David is running for, for his life. He has, his, uh, he has already been anointed king. I think it's in 1 Samuel 6. He's already been anointed king, and so he recognizes what his calling is. However, Saul is still on the throne. And Saul recognizes <laughs> that, that, that this guy, David, he's, he, he, he's, he's anointed, and, and so he's, he's angry, and anger rises up on the inside of him to the point where David is just minding his business, playing his harp for the king, and, and Saul tries to take his head off. And so he's running for his life. And, and Saul uh, sends men out to go and destroy David. David, who has done no wrong, he's just praising God and, and hasn't been, he didn't ask for any of this. And Saul is after he wants blood. And so David is in this place where he's like, listen, this isn't justice. I didn't do any of this. God, I was minding my business with, 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 the, with the bears and, and the lions and a, and a shepherd out in the field. I didn't ask to be king. I didn't ask to do any of this. And not only that, but I was good to Saul. I honored Saul. I cared about Saul. And he seeks to kill me. And God, you know about this. And here I am in this cave, running for my life. This is not fair. And then lo and behold, as he's hiding and running for his life, he sees Saul as he goes to relieve himself. Understand that Saul is in a very uh, 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 vulnerable position. And that's why the scripture lets you know what Saul was doing. Read it for yourself. He went to relieve himself by a cave, not knowing that David is in the cave. And so David, the brother, sneaks up on Saul, sword in hand. And I can just imagine the moment where he says, I can end all of this right now. I mean, I've already been anointed king. I could just, whoosh, and this whole thing be over. Vengeance by my hands. Because God has taken too long. He's taken so long. I've been here in this cave. I don't know for how long. This is ridiculous. Look at all the Psalms I wrote. In this cave. <laughs> I got nothing else to do. But write Psalms and be scared for my life. And I can end it all right now. There he is relieving himself. He has no idea that I'm here. And he's super vulnerable. I can do it. But instead of killing Saul, y'all know the scripture. He says, Remember the word of God, touch not, touch not mine anointed. Do my prophet no harm. And so he takes, he takes the sword though. He doesn't just say, now we like, he, he, he didn't say that and then go back into his cave and pray. He didn't, he didn't y'all, just, just read it for yourself. He cuts off a piece of his garment, a corner of his garment, and Saul walks away. Now, what is the significance of him cutting the corner of and this so so and I want to explain this to you so that you understand that that there was some there was some flesh <laughs> there was some flesh involved in what David did if you understand the significance of the corner of the garment it is very likely that Saul was walking around in kingly attire and, and, and kingly attire for, for, for this uh, uh, nation, the people of God, that, that, he, that he reigned in, it, it was likely that his garment that he had resembled both power and authority, particularly if he was wearing a, a tallit, and the, and the ends of the garments of a tallit is very significant to anointing and authority. And so when David cuts off the corner of his garment, what he's saying in his flesh is, I know you think you're king. I'm cutting off. Your authority has been, it's been cut off. And so watch this. David takes the piece that he cuts. Because David could have just cut the garment and walked away and said, okay, I, I restrained myself a little something. But he holds on to the corner as a memento. And when he comes face to face with Saul again, and he does it in a way that he makes it sound like, you know, I'm all right, I'm all right. But he's showing him, <laughs> got the corner of your garment. 
to say two things. I could have killed you. Number one. And number two, you no longer it, brother, is me. Your authority has been cut off. And so, and so here's, here's the other, and I, and I, and I highlight this for you to, to see that David is struggling with this, with this, with this uh, challenge of not falling into the snare and the trap of getting vengeance by his own hands and at the same time leaning in and trusting that God is going to get vengeance for him. He's, he's trusting this. Listen, let's go back to our opening scripture, Psalms 13, 1 through 6. Now that I put it in context, it says it there. It says, how long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? He's struggling. He's upset. How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? Like, do you want me sad? What is going on here? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fall. Watch this. But I trust. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will say, I love it, because David is always telling his flesh what to do. We could have cut his head off, and this whole thing could have been over. But that is outside of God's design for my life. I could have, and, and even though I'm angry, and even though I'm frustrated, and even though I want to end this whole thing and walk away, I will praise the Lord. Hands, feet, mind, body, soul, spirit, I will praise the Lord and sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. In other words, why would he stop being good to me now? Yeah. He's setting me up for the biggest victory I've ever experienced in my life, he changes. He goes from lamenting to praising. And it's because he's experiencing the challenges of waiting on God while resting in the peace of knowing God. He goes back and forth. Now listen, like David, know that God is just. Somebody say, God is just. God is just. He is just, and he sees all that we go through. And he has plans for vengeance in his way and on his time. Somebody say, his way. His time. his time. Now, if that felt uncomfortable for you to say, I'm sorry for you. Just say it over and over again because it needs to be his way, his time. He knows how to get justice. And one of the things I realize will help you in your quest for vengeance is getting to know God. Focus more on getting to know God than you are on vengeance. And you will see how comfortably you can sleep knowing that God is on your side. Get to know God in the midst of your quest for vengeance. You see, when you know God and you know how much God cares about justice, you don't pray to the justice system. God, oh judge, please, please judge, just do what it is that only you can do, judge. Breathes air, bleeds just like you and I. You don't pray to the justice system and you certainly don't pray to the United States president. <laughs> justice! If I click this box, I'm going to get justice. How has that worked for you so far? Ooh, it's quiet. Do not make any earthly honor them, but do not make any earthly authority your God. When you know God and you're seeking vengeance, the more you know God, the more you know God got you. God got you. God got you. I got you. You don't manipulate justice to fit your preferred timing and punishment. Judge, that wasn't enough. That's all right. I'll see you in the street. Because that was not enough. Don't we say that? We say that. I've heard some of y'all in the foyer. <laughs> they got what? That's not enough. That would have been me. Lord have mercy. When you know God, you don't blast the person who did you wrong on Twitter. You don't hold them hostage with your unforgiveness. You walk in peace and you find rest in God. See, godly vengeance is allowing the Lord to move and bring true justice in his intricate way and in his intricate time. Listen, understand this. Remember what I told you about how God, when you see God repeating something over and over again, two things are happening. He wants you to know it's important to him 
and he wants you to know you're probably going to struggle with this, so I'm going to put it everywhere I can in the word, in my love letter to you. Two things are happening. We saw that as it pertained to not getting revenge, but guess what God also talks about over and over and over and over and over and over and over again? He talks about justice over and over again. Why? Because he cares about justice. Psalm 33 verse 5, it says he loves righteousness and what? Justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. Isaiah 61 verse 8, it says this. It says, for I the Lord what? Love justice. I don't just care about it. I don't just think about it sometimes. When it passes my mind, I'll think about it a little bit. No, I love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Let's go to Psalm chapter 106, verse 3. Blessed are they who observe justice and do righteousness at all times. I reward that. Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Beloved, never Never avenge yourselves. Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. John, want more? Okay, Psalm chapter 45, verse 6. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. Watch this. And a scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You rule and you reign with justice. You, go to, you don't go to sleep, but you're thinking about us. When you're looking at us, you're thinking about justice. When you wrote your word, you were thinking about justice. When whatever happened to us happened to us, you were focusing on justice. God cares about justice. When we see racial inequality, God cares about justice. When we see police brutality, God cares about justice. When we see all kind of things happening in unequal pay in the workplace, God cares about justice. What happened to your kids? God cares about justice. What happened to you? God cares about justice. What happened in the political realm. God cares about justice. What happens around the nations, God cares. He cares about justice. And the problem that we sometimes have is because we care about justice, we start getting on militant and full of ourselves. And now we won't go and do justice for ourselves. You don't know justice like God knows justice. You can't do justice like God can do justice. Justice by your own hands is called revenge. And it only leads to more confusion and chaos. So instead, we'll follow our great and mighty father as it pertains to his plans for justice. God may, may understand this. God may sometimes use you for his plan of vengeance for somebody else. I'm telling you, God, what God has done it, he's done it, it, it through the children of Israel in war. Listen, you all took this land, I'm giving it back to my children. Go on, I'm going to fight for you. You don't even need to lift, it, lift the sword. I got your back. And so understand, God has plans for vengeance, but it can't be on your time, by your terms. You can't care about justice more than God. And I'm concerned. 90% of the people that I hear walking around the streets talking about justice, justice, justice are seeking it on their terms because maybe, just maybe, they feel like either God is too soft, he doesn't know, or he's too slow. If that wasn't convincing enough, all the scriptures that I just read to you about how much God cares about justice, if that wasn't enough, I need you to understand this. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Jesus, the anointed one, the savior, the lion of the tribe of Judah, was seated at the right hand of the father. Understand, God saw the injustice that was played on us in the garden. You mad at me, and so you went after my babies. And as a result, there is war and bigotry and racism and disease and hatred and now they suffer with that every day so I'm gonna do justice because of you they're suffering with the sickness of sin so the biggest act of justice mankind has ever seen has already taken place he said I'll step out of heaven and I'll walk onto the earth 
and I walk amongst you. I'll be the living word. I'll be the truth, the way, and the life. And there's nothing that the devil can do to stop me. I'll go all the way to the cross. Though I was innocent, I will be slain so my blood can wash you clean. My blood can make you whole. My blood can make you whole again. It can destroy the effects of sin in your life. I know it's not fair. I know that you were born separated from God because of what somebody else did, but I'm stepping out of heaven. And I'm going to make sure you don't suffer for somebody else's sin. If that's not justice, because we could say this, we could say, God, it's not fair that I was born separated from God. I wasn't in that garden. Get even them. Why do I have to suffer with the sickness of sin? And God says, you know what, my daughter? You know what, my son? You're right. But I got the remedy. Justice frees you from the slavery of sin. Yeah. Come on, y'all. That's good. That's good. If you've never seen Jesus as an act of justice, you just saw it right there. The greatest act of justice has already taken place. I'm free from the bondage that I was once in. I'm delivered from the yoke of slavery that sin had me in. Justice has been served in the form of a savior named Jesus. He's passionate about justice. And that was the revenge. That was God avenging us. I mean, the best is still yet to come. But that was God avenging. Do you know how mad the devil is when somebody walks up here to this platform and, 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 and in spite of everything that they've been through, gives their heart to the Lord? That's justice being done that the devil can't stand. Otherwise, if it wasn't justice, the devil would leave you alone. If it wasn't justice, the devil would not be so mad at you because you have been avenged. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. All right, I'm going to move because some of y'all looking at me like, maybe you're online. You get what I'm saying. You get what I'm saying. You've been avenged. Thank you, Jesus. And so, and so God cares about, about justice. Yeah, that's as it pertains to, to salvation, which is the, the biggest act of justice we could ever experience. But what about like the stuff that I've been through like in everyday, in everyday life? God cares about the persecuted, the murdered, the spousal and, and the child that's been abused. He cares about the oppressed, the false prophets, the false teachers. He cares about heresy, those who are heretic teachers. They're going to pay. Somebody say they're going to pay. They're not going to be without punishment. If he said it, he will do it. I believe it. And I trust it. They are going. And maybe that's something that you need to say out loud. That you've never said to yourself before because you've been so focused on getting revenge for yourself. By God's hands. By God's hands. They are going to pay. If they repent not. Oh, you don't want to say that part. <laughs> if they don't repent. Some of y'all paused. Some of y'all paused. And said, Wait a minute. If they repent, they get off scot-free. That's not fair. Understand this. They still going to reap what they've sown. They still going to reap. But don't, don't get into it. They still going to reap what they've sown. But God is going to shower them with the same grace that he showered you with. Aren't you glad for his grace? Aren't you glad for his mercy? Aren't you glad for the opportunity to repent? I want you to stand to your feet this morning. Justice has been served. Don't get caught up. I love something Pastor Kier said the other day. This was hilarious, but it was so true. He said, running around this world trying to fix everything and make everything perfect is like arranging furniture on the Titanic. I'm not saying don't seek justice. <laughs> but as you're seeking justice, understand, at the bottom and the core of all of it is sin. It's sin. The same way that you're a sinner, 
or you were a sinner is the same way that they are a sinner. Whoever did whatever they did to you, an imperfect fallen human being. And here's where, here's where we struggle. I want to I wanna read this because the Lord dropped this on my heart and I don't want to mess it up. The truth is, the evidence of a transformed heart is when we let go of our desire for someone to pay the price by your doing and desire and, and you come to a place where you desire for them to come to know the one who prayed the part, paid the price by God's doing. As much as the thought of them expecting God's wrath or experiencing God's wrath might make you happy, the heart of Christ within you will draw you to desire to see them freed from the bondage and influence of Satan, just like you were. God, God gives us a snapshot. He's a snapshot of heaven. He really breaks down. A lot of people wonder what heaven looks like. And God gives us a really nice picture. I believe there's some things he, you know, he keeps secret that we're just going to be able to see when we get there. But he gives us a nice picture of what heaven looks like. Read it for yourself. And he also gives us a snapshot of what eternal separation looks like. And, and, and what those who do not accept Christ on the day of his return, what awaits them? All kind of beasts are going to be freed on the earth and scorpion tails and men with uh, the face of men and lion's teeth and they're just going to be pricking and poking people with their scorpion tails and they're going to want to die but they can't die. And then after all of that, some folks are still not going to repent and they're going to be thrown into the lake of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth and fire that gives no light and it smells like sulfur. And you're going to want to die you can't die. You're going to be thirsty but you can't drink. And on top of all of that, you're going to be able to get a glimpse of what's happening in heaven, though you cannot join. And everybody in heaven, nobody in heaven remembers you, because if they remembered that you are in hell, there's going to be sorrow in heaven, and there's no sorrow in heaven. So you've forgotten because your name is not written in the book of life. <laughs> I tell y'all this now, I refuse. It's not going to be me. And I'm going to give everything that I got here on this earth to make sure it's not you. Watch this. He doesn't give us a snapshot of what hell looks like so that we can say, yeah, yes, I want them to experience that. Experience fire that gives no light. Experience an eternity in a place that smells like sulfur. Experience pain day in and day out. That's so bad, you grit your teeth into powder and want to die but don't die. And all you hear is wailing and crying. You're not saying, I want them to experience that. When you know the God of justice, you recognize that he paints his picture for us. Not that we would pray that people will go there, but that we would pray that people don't. He's not showing us this so that we hope people go there. Yeah, there's going to, I mean, some people, his desire is that not one should perish, and some folks are going to go there. That is just the reality. But he lets us know as the saved and the redeemed, this is what's going to come. Not so that you can celebrate because people are going there, because there are some Christians that do that. Yeah, they go, there's a special place in hell for them. And it might feel good to say that. But I guarantee you, that's your flesh talking. It's a special place in hell. What does that even mean? It's a special, it's a reserved VIP in hell for them. That's your flesh talking. What you ought to say is, I hope they never experience. That they would come to know the same Savior that saved me. Yeah, they're going to pay for what they did, but I don't want them to pay like that. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Let your only act of vengeance be forgiveness and love. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread. If he's thirsty, give him some water to drink. For so you will heap coals of fire on his head. And the Lord will 
reward you. I know it's not easy. I know it's not easy. But this is a challenge in your growth and your relationship with your God. Do you really believe that God's got your back? If you do, you have to let it go and pray their repentance and that they come to Jesus. Then you will be greatly rewarded and you get to walk with your peace restored and your joy restored and your hope renewed and you're walking in gentleness and goodness and love and kindness and self-control and all the abundance of the fruit of the Spirit. You can move on with your life. Thank you. Y'all get anything from this today? So with every head bowed and with every eye closed, there's somebody here today that's been seeking justice on their terms. Or maybe you sought justice. If you you got justice by your hands and you realize it just made things bloody and ugly and more confusing. You thought that it was going to bring you your peace back, but instead you still, you still feel down. Now what have you to turn to that you've already acted out on that act of vengeance? You can turn to him, the Lord. Maybe you're here today and you've been moving forward in your life seeking revenge and that revenge has become your God. And as a result, you have sinned and you have sinned and you've done things your own way and you have, have knowingly or unknowingly walked away from an opportunity to repent and to serve the God of justice and make him your God as opposed to vengeance. You don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you heard me talking about that description of hell and you realize, oh my God, if I don't seize this moment, that just might be me. I don't know if the Lord is my Savior, but I want to be sure because I might not make it to tomorrow for all I know, and I don't want to die and experience eternity in hell. I don't want that for you either. So if you're here today with every head bowed and every eye closed, and it's your desire to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're throwing away this act of vengeance, you're throwing away this obsession with vengeance, and you want to run toward his righteous outstretched hand and be forgiven of all of your sin. Accept him as Lord and Savior that you would go to heaven. Every head bowed and every eye closed. There's only one way to heaven, and that is through Jesus. I don't care what the world told you. I don't care what your favorite song said. It don't matter what's on your button that you got on your shirt. It is through Jesus and him alone. If you're here today and you want to know this Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you want to be saved from the grips of hell, just lift your hands and say, Pastor, you've been talking to me all day. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Raise your hand, raise your hand nice and high so I can see it. Nice and high so I can see it. Don't let this moment pass. Don't let this moment pass you by. Hallelujah, there is one. I see you, my sister. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, yeah, you know what to do. You know what to do. Come on, my sister. Come on, my sister. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, we ought to sound like heaven. We ought to sound like heaven. We ought to sound like heaven in here. Justice is served. Justice is served. another group of people I'm going to call every head bowed and every eye closed. Maybe you're not sure. You're like, I got saved that one time when I was like 11, and, but nothing really changed. I've been doing the same things I've always been doing. I still do stuff I know I shouldn't do, and I don't care about doing the stuff that I know I shouldn't do. I don't feel no type of way about it. So maybe, just maybe, I'm really not saved. If that's you, you're not sure. There's been no change in your life. You have no desire to get to know God closer, but something in this moment is saying, no, nah, this is the real deal. You accepted him, but you, you don't know if it was real. You've been doing your own thing. I'm calling you to. I'm calling you to. That's called a rededication. I'm calling you to. If that's you, I just want you to come and join us here at this altar. I'll give you a moment. I'll give you a moment. And then I'll invite you that are there at home to come to know. If, that, if that's you at home, I just want you to pray this prayer along with us. My sister, 
you who are here, can you just lift your hands like this? Can someone come and stand with her? Hallelujah. Symbolically saying, you're not alone. You're not alone. Never alone. Never alone. Never alone. Sis, we're going to pray this prayer together, but especially you, I want you to pray this out loud. And everybody in the house, we're going to pray this together. Say, Father, thank you for this opportunity that I have to accept you as my Lord and my Savior. I realize I can't save myself. I'm not good enough. So I come to you, my God, all righteous and all knowing. You are able to save me by the blood of Jesus. So today, I give you my heart, my mind, my body, and my very soul. Lord, I believe that you suffered, that you died, and were buried. And on the third day, you rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures. And you ascended into heaven. And you gave me the gift of your Holy Spirit to lead me, to guide me, to correct me, to empower me. I receive that gift. Fill me from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. Lord, on this day, you are mine. And finally, I am yours. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are so grateful for what God has done for us. And at this moment, I just want to close out. Father God, if everybody can just lift their hand and surrender to God. I think this message spoke to each and every one of us. There's things in each of our hearts that God just needs to renew and just to clear and things that we have to give to him. So Father God, we lift our hands. We lift our hands, Lord God, and we release those things, Lord God. And we trust you. We trust you, we trust you, we trust you in this moment, Father God. Right now, Lord God, we say, I trust you. If you guys can just say that with me. Say, God, I trust you. I trust you, Lord. Lord God, you see us right here. You see our hearts, Father God. We submit everything to you, Lord God. And we ask you to do what only you can do. Be God in our lives. Lord God, go before us as we have this week ahead of us. Lord God, give us the strength. Give us the words. Give us the courage. Give us the understanding, Lord God, as we stand on your word with every step that we take and every move that we make. Father God, have your way, and we thank you for speaking to us on today. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. (laughs) Quick reminder, we do have a medical... um, medical ministry today it's for mental health it's for mental health right in the cafe so you guys that want to hear our doctor speak on mental health please join us directly after service right there in the cafe god bless you all congratulations i am so excited that you accepted the lord as your personal savior you're probably thinking where do i go next listen we have a booklet that we want to send you that will help you with your walk with christ so please go and click the link in the description to receive more information we'll see you very soon god bless